Welcome to the podcast. Um, I'm really excited about Building with Brick, the name of the podcast. It's uh, foundational wisdom. And what we're trying to do is reach people to visit a little bit about coaching, careers, and Christ. And today I got a great guest to join us, uh, Ken Berry. Ken and I have known each other for nearly 50 years. He's only like 60 now, but um, we've known each other a long, long time. Kenny was a Major League Baseball player for 11 years, an all-star. I think he made the all-star team in 67, if I remember correctly, and uh, was a Golden Glove winner for two different teams with the White Sox and the Angels. So he had a great career, but when he finished his career, he decided that uh, for one reason or another, he, he was going to go into coaching. And I think uh, because of that, I believe that he's got a wealth of knowledge that he can share with us. And he's been gracious enough to join us today. So Kenny, welcome to the podcast. Love having you. Thanks, Joe. Good to be here. Well, uh, you know, we met a long, long time ago, but I, I moved to Topeka after I got out of college. And that's where I met you. You invited me to play on your city league basketball team, which was a really competitive team. It was great. And it was great playing with you. And you were a wonderful coach. I, let me tell you that right off. You were a wonderful coach. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I didn't know anything about your history other than you, you grew up in Topeka and you were a great athlete. But you might fill us in a little bit on, you know, how you grew up, where you got your competitive advantage, uh, you know, what sports you were playing and why you chose baseball. Well, this is the good old days when I started out, when the guys would get together and go up to Gage School and everybody ride their bikes up and we'd play ball until it was time to go home and eat. And uh, we'd have lunch and go back and do it again. And then we'd go out and, in the street and playing a streak until my dad came home. So we knew it was time to go eat then. And then uh, I don't know if that's, I only hit about 250 lifetime, but uh, when the lightning bugs came out, we'd get our bats <laughs> and we'd go out. And when we saw one light up, we'd set up and get ready in our stance. And then when they lit up again, hopefully we'd light them up. So <laughs> That was that was kind of where I, I took a lot of swings and I may have had some misses, but uh, you know just the good old days where you we played uh, I played basketball up the street at Phil Brown's house on the corner with uh, dirt floor you mm -hmm. might say outdoors mm -hmm. yeah and then uh, played baseball a block away at school uh, and saw block when I was in uh, fourth grade I think it was. I used to always go early and play softball with the, the girls because the girls were playing, but the boys didn't have any any way to play. They couldn't play with a hard baseball. So we were, I would say, hey, can I play? And, you know, I'd get my glove and go out and play with the girls. So that was my first encounter with women, I guess. But they let me let me in, so I must have uh, must have been okay. That's, and uh, that's then great. we... we uh, I dug up my own pit. I had the neighbor across the street. His uh, dad brought a, a load of uh, sand in and put a sand pit out in the backyard. And we got a bamboo pole, a couple of sticks to hold it up. And then a high jump. So that's where I mm. learned to high jump, did the Western roll. And, uh, you know, we just, and then football, we throw the football around. So I played every, every sport I could. And when you were in high school, you went to Washburn Rural, is that right? Yeah, it was an interesting situation because I uh, started out at Roosevelt Junior High, which is uh, no longer in, in effect now. But um, I was in ninth grade. I was uh, about five foot four, five foot five and 130, 40 pounds. And I was looking at the possibility of going to have, well, I was in the district. Fort Topeka High, which was uh, mm. 2,000 kids, mm -hmm. and Washburn Rural was 300. So I mm -hmm. talked to my dad, and I said, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be big enough to play basketball or football at Topeka High, and I've been playing uh, baseball with a lot of the Topeka High guys uh, playing Legion ball, so that was not a, a concern. 
And so uh, he said, well, let's go out and watch Laird Noller play at uh, Washington Rural. So we went out, we watched three or four of their games. And I decided at uh, when I was a sophomore to to go to Washington Rural. So I had to transfer. So I was ineligible for uh, the first semester. Mm -hmm. And the last game of the, we, we weren't very good. We were not a very good team. They had a, a poor background as far as winning and football. And, you know, that was, that didn't really bother me, but I really, I had to ride the bus with just the regular students. Couldn't go with the team. So I'm sitting in Haskell stadium in Lawrence with about a 20 mile an hour wind out of the North, 30 some degrees freezing my tail off and we get beat 81 to nothing. <laughs> and I thought, man, I really made a great decision here. <laughs> so at semester, I become eligible. And of course, then I start playing basketball. But the next year we play Haskell again, we play them at home. They beat us 28 to 14. My senior year, we finished six and three. We should have been seven and two, but uh, my guard tripped a guy on a 80-yard pass reception that w would have won the game for us. And so we ended up losing to a team down south in Altamont. But we uh, we beat Haskell 12 to six. Hey. And that was back when the Lonesome Inn was in play. The Lonesome Inn was where if you uh, went out, let's say you're, I ran left half, and wide receiver. So I'd run a sweep to the right. And then when I came back toward the huddle, I would just see somebody and I go within 15, 20 feet and said, I'm going out. So I'd go run over and stand in front of our, our <laughs> sideline and about six inches from the sideline. And then Rod McMaster, who a lot of people will recognize Rod's name, would come up to the line. He was our quarterback and he would you know, uh, ready, set, hut, hut, and he'd be looking over to see if anybody was covering me. If nobody was covering me, then he would fake a handoff to the right half, step back, throw it in about 60 yards, and if it worked, it worked. Well, we beat Haskell on that play. Wow. Now, this is the interesting part. 55 years later, this guy comes up and taps me on the back, and I turn around, and it was a Native American guy. And my mother was part Native American. She's part Potawatomi. So I turned around and I said, hey, how's it going? And he says, well, you don't remember me. I said, no, I don't think I do, but should I? And he says, well, coach told me if you went up and bought a box of popcorn, I was supposed to go up and help you eat it. <laughs> <laughs> so they had seen, they'd seen that play, you know, where they knew I, I yeah. was sneak out so they were on top of it supposedly but uh he didn't quite he didn't quite see the whole thing so anyway <laughs> that's great well so that, that was my got my football career started at at, at uh, worst rural well you played basketball there too didn't you played basketball there uh and you know i don't get a chance to brag very often now if you want me to brag a little bit i will <laughs> it's okay i you, i you led the it. i led the city in scoring in football and I led the city in scoring in basketball in Dang. Topeka. See, I could believe now, that's basketball. all the bragging I'm going to do. <laughs> well, I could I could believe the basketball part because that year I played with you in Topeka, you shot a lot. Well, I did not. <laughs> I passed off to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, after high school, then did you go straight into baseball? In the no, baseball? I uh, I had a, a football scholarship at uh, Wichita State. Okay, and uh, went down there. And Wichita State, you know, was a Division One and all that. But uh, the freshmen were not eligible. Yes. So I had to, I had to, uh, I couldn't go out or couldn't play on the varsity. Uh, we had four freshman games. We had a game with, I think, uh, Tulsa and maybe North Texas and a couple of junior colleges. And that was it. And so after that, uh, first year in school I had played uh, Ban Johnson ball in uh, McPherson the year before after I graduated from high school I'd gone to McPherson I lived with my uh, football coach's parents 
Bob Peel, right across the street from the, the ballpark. Hmm. And then that team uh, folded, and I went to Liberal the next year after my first year in, high, in college. I went to Liberal and played out there, and then uh, the Liberal manager called up Ted Lyons, who was a Hall of Famer, through two no-hitters, I believe, with the White Sox. He came and drove all the way out from uh, Louisiana and was there to scout our team. Hmm. Well, he scouted uh, myself and, and Max Johnson, who was my buddy. We played together for... Uh, all the way from uh, morning league baseball when we were like 13, played Legion ball together, and then we ended up playing in Liberal. So um, he signed both of us. Uh, it was a guy named Phil Hips who became a doctor who signed with the uh, – he was a second baseman, signed with the Phillies, and then uh, had a guy uh, that signed with the, the Red Sox who was a pitcher, and – the next year, I'm facing him, and he went 24 and one, I believe, mm -hmm. and blew his arm out. And oh. you know, I mean that that oh. makes sense that when he pitched that much in a in an A league with 135 or 40 games, you know, you're you're leaving him in there, I think, a little bit too long. So, anyway, that's that's how I got into baseball. How long were you in the minor leagues before you got your shot at the majors? I was in the minor leagues the normal amount of time, which was a, between four and five years. Mm -hmm. Now it's three to four years because the guys are making so much money. They want to get the big guys that are done out of the way and get the younger guys that aren't <laughs> making as much money, get them in there. And so they kind of rush them a little bit uh, compared to what we used to do. We had usually four or five years. You had, you had eight, a uh, C ball, D ball, B ball, A ball, double A and triple A. So you had six yeah. levels, yeah. which they do now too. They've got several rookie leagues. Um, you know, when I when I wrote my book, and I, I know that you've read it and um, at least you told me you enjoyed it. I hope I you did. did. <laughs> uh, and it's all about uh, coaching and not only coaching in, in sports, but also in business, et cetera. But um, when was your first opportunity to coach and, and, and maybe why did you get into coaching? Cause I mean, you were a great, great player. Uh, well, um, I'm a sophomore in high school, as I said, and I'm ineligible. And my, uh, principal at Washburn Rural was, he was one of those guys you look at and you respected him right away. He was, he was a, a solid Christian, but, very stern and he had one of those big paddles up on the wall that you had heard the stories about if McElroy needed to use his paddle he would so you know everybody was kind of well okay and so he called he yelled at me one time said, hey, get in there, get in there. so he said shut the door <laughs> okay I will sit down I said okay so he says uh next week you're going to take two basketballs and you're going to go to Wakarusa and you're going to go down there and you're going to coach the elementary school team. I said, okay, where's Wakarusa? <laughs> <laughs> Wakarusa, for folks who don't know, about 15 miles, 14 miles from Topeka south, you know, just a little bitty teeny burger. You could go through it with your eyes closed and you'd would take about 10 seconds. So I went down there and I had the worst group that you would ever ask for. These, I don't know half of them had even touched a basketball before. You know, they were nice kids and good looking and all that, but I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> they couldn't do anything. So, you know, I was down there. I think I went two days a week for probably four or five weeks. And, um, uh, I got this thought that, well, hey, maybe I ought to find somebody to play. So I called the Wanamaker coach, and uh, Wanamaker coach, you know, uh, like a, a bear that sees a deer walking down the road that, that's blind. He says, oh, here's an here's a easy meal. I uh, 
I got just, we just got whomped, you know, and, and my kids, did, they tried and everything. So another two, three weeks goes by and I've been working with them and, and I thought, well, I've seen some improvement. Now we're starting to, to do some things. I called him up and we played them again and they just barely beat us. Hey. And you didn't think that didn't hook me for coaching? <laughs> I said, man, this is great. So that was it. That's that was where I got started. Sophomore you know, year. I've always been, I've always been, and I read in your book, you know, competitive. Like when you were growing up, you took your brother to the barn or he took <laughs> you to the barn and you guys played to 100. Well, you know, that I've done that thousands of times. It's different sports. Right yeah. now I'm, I'm playing words with friends on the, the internet with 55 different people. So wow. I love, I love competition. Yeah, you do. And that was one thing that really stood out when we first met. And, and it was just a pleasure to be on the court with you. Just, you love playing with people that play hard and play smart. And, and yeah. you did that in basketball and I, you had to do it in baseball. Um, speaking of baseball, you played for a number of, of coaches and managers. Uh, who was your favorite and, and what, what lessons did you take from some of those coaches to um, kind of incorporate into your coaching methods? Well, here's my, uh, basically, I guess you call it a philosophy. My philosophy is you need to be aggressive. You need to attack, you know, this is Bobby Knight stuff here. You need to attack the other team's weaknesses and you need to take your strong points and try to implement them as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So when I played for, uh, well, Al Lopez was my first manager. And he was one of those guys that didn't say much to anybody. We had a good pitching staff. This was established. He'd been there for 15 years or whatever. Good pitching staff, good defense, and had a little speed, Aparicio and a couple other guys that could run. And then uh, when I was there, I mean, we didn't do anything except try to get one run. And we got one run, we'd try to get one more. And that was it. We didn't, we didn't hit and run. We didn't delay steal. Uh, you know, so those are some of the things that, that I use a lot when I coach is, or manage is uh, the delayed steal and the hit and run. Well, so Lopez got sick and they brought in Eddie Stanky. And Eddie Stanky, for me, was as far as, you know, a guy that, that knew the game. And, and the main thing he said, we get 27 outs, we're not going to waste them. So don't, not going to throw them away, not going to be stupid. Well, he was very difficult to play for. But he also taught me more about the game than any manager I had. And so... Uh, you know, at one time I was in Boston, we we're in the pennant race. I think it was probably 67. I was in the pennant race. I couldn't get out and, and take infield because my back was hurting. So I went into the trainer to get a quick rub and some hot stuff on my back so I could play the game. And he came in and, and looked at me laying on the table and he said, you're a dog. You're a dog. I mean, you know, now here's the guy I've been busting my tail for. <laughs> <laughs> for a full year running into fences and jumping on fences and stealing bases and breaking up double plays. And he comes in and he says that. And, you know, I understood where he was coming from. He was only, he was frustrated and he was from old school. He and Leo DeRocher went way back. I mean, they used to hit guys in the head just because they, they looked at him wrong. And, you know, that's, that was old school stuff. Well, then from there, I went on to California and I had uh, Bobby Winkles and Lefty Phillips who spit on his shirt. You, you know, whenever you talk to Lefty, you had to stand back a little bit because he always chewed and he'd spit. And it was all over his front of his shirt. So he wasn't, he wasn't my most impressive manager that I had. And Del Rice, who was an old catcher. And then I, I got traded to uh, Milwaukee. Oh, oh I got a backup. 1970. Uh, Don Gutteridge ended up as our manager because uh, Lopez got sick. And Gutteridge was, you know, and he's a Kansas guy, and I loved him because he was a great guy, but he was not what you would call a good manager. He did nothing. We had the phone would ring up above, 
and to bring in the dugout, it would be the general manager who was an alcoholic, by the way. I'm going to give you a lot of insight here. He was an alcoholic, and he would call down and tell Gutteridge what to do. Oh, my. And so, I mean, no. it, was, we, we, it was the worst team I ever played on. We were 56 and 106. Oh. That, was, that was our record. So now Long year. The, the last month of the year, they brought in Chuck Tanner, and Chuck was going to take over yeah. the next year, and he wanted to get a feel for our team. So Chuck is, you know, I mean, what a great guy. I loved him because he was most positive, upbeat manager I ever played for, and that's kind of what I tried to take from him. Uh, I haven't taken anything from anybody except Stanky, the aggressiveness. So I'm taking the positive part from Chuck. And uh, I'll just give you a, for instance, I'm up, nobody out, man on second, scores close. And I hit a ground ball to second base, moved the runner over. He comes out of the dugout. And this is the first or second game that, that he's there. He comes out of the dugout right at me. And Chuck was 6'4 and about 260. You know, and I didn't know what was going on. I thought he was gonna <laughs> gonna hit me because I hit a ground ball and made it out. He comes up and gives me a bear hug. He said, "I went to move that guy," and so yeah. I'm going. This is great. This is the way I want to want to you know always want to play with guys like that. So, all right, now I get traded to the Angels, and then I got the three years with those guys. For none of them really impressed me. Then I go to Milwaukee. I get traded. Dale Crandall, the old catcher for the yeah. Braves, mm -hmm. is the manager in Milwaukee. I'd never been with a guy. Now, this is my 11th or 10th year. I've never been with a manager that used the hit and run before. I mean, the, not the hit and run, I'm sorry, the delayed steal. Oh. And if you don't, if you want me to yeah. explain a delayed steal, I will. But, uh, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but. It's a great play. Yeah, why don't you explain it? Because not everybody's going to be familiar with baseball. Okay, well, it's it's a fun play. And, and, and there's several different things you can look for. You can anticipate a delayed seal, but they don't do it in the big leagues nowadays. It's uh, exit velocity and all that garbage that they're, they're saying is good. You strike out more than you get base hits. That's not, not a good way to go. So a delayed steal is when you're on first and the ball's thrown. You take a secondary lead. You shuffle off two or three sh uh, shuffles, and then you read whether the ball's hit or whether it's swung at and missed, the ball's in the dirt or whatever, and then you go back to first base. Well, what you do is, is the ideal delayed steal is a left-hand hitter at the plate, and you're looking after the ball's thrown back to the pitcher. You're looking towards second base. You're glancing. You're not staring because you don't want to give it away, but – either that or the coach does it, they look to see if the shortstop and second baseman make a move towards second base in case of a delayed steal. If they don't, they normally, what they do is they put their head down, they might smooth the dirt out or something, and then get ready for the next pitch. Well, if that's the case, what you do is you, you start your shuffle when the leg, the pitcher's leg comes up, you start your shuffle, you get an extra shuffle and as the ball goes by the hitter, nobody said anything yet. The catcher can't see you because you have a left-handed hitter. And then he's liable to go to his knees or relax. And then you're running and you're over halfway down there when somebody yells. And now it's a foot race between the shortstop or the second baseman mm -hmm. to second base with the runner. And believe me, if it's done right, I don't. I haven't seen many many times when it's not been successful. Oh, that's great, great play. And you it's used, a great play. You used that yourself when you were coaching. Yeah, I used it. I I didn't over overuse it. I don't think I abused it. But um, if I'm coaching third base, which I did when I managed, you know, and I look down there and just out of the corner of my eye, I check. It was easy to see that that this was the right situation. And when as soon as the a left-handed hitter, <coughs> excuse me, came up with uh, a guy on first. You know, then I, I could, I could pretty well say, okay, this is a good time for it. And if I'm awake, you know, watching the guys at, at, in the middle or a catcher that goes goes to his knees, 
then it's got to work. And if it doesn't, it's because my guy at first base didn't didn't uh, shuffle off quick enough. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Del Crandall was your your coach at that time, or your manager? Is he, that who? He was the yeah. He was the manager in Milwaukee. Okay. Uh, we and you know and, and we kept stats on on these things. Out of 162 games, he used a delayed steal seven times. Hmm. Guess guess how many times it worked. Seven. 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 <laughs> I'm going, if you got 162 games and all the situations you have, left-hand hitter, man on first, if you use it once a game and it's it's successful 140 out of 162, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, you know, and that that's when you, you don't do it very often, but you pick a spot when it's maybe the tying run, the winning run, go-ahead run, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and you use it. But if you use it in the first innings, nothing, nothing, uh, you know, then you're giving it away. Yeah, that's – that's. now, was was he your last manager, Del Crandall? Uh, Crandall was not. My last manager turned out to be Frank Robinson. Oh, wow. And, and that leads into another interesting story. I'm sitting at home. I've gotten released from Milwaukee. It's November. Uh a sports writer called me and said, well, he says, what do you think? And I said, what do you mean? The weather's fairly nice. It's 60 degrees. What do you mean what I think? So, well, you've been released. I said, oh, well, they didn't bother to call me and tell me. <laughs> they just released me. He said, well, I just want to let you know. I said, what do you think? I said, oh, that's all right. No problem. I just, I'll move on with my life and see what, what I can dig up here. So uh, about a week later, uh, Phil Segge from, uh, Cleveland called me and he said uh, you got anything working I said no not yet he said well he said uh, I need somebody like you that will come in because Rick Manning is going to be our center fielder and I got Charlie Spikes and uh, George Hendricks and Oscar Gamble those are my outfielders and I need you to come in and in case Manning doesn't work out uh, you'd be our center fielder or you'd be our backup, you know, for the guys that are playing. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, fine with me. He said, I'll give you 30,000. I said, well, I'd been making 55,000. And by the way, so the folks know, we started out my first year uh, in the minor, in the major leagues, and as, as everybody was, you made seventy five hundred dollars. Now it's six hundred thousand. So I was born about five years too too early. But anyway, anyway, uh, ten minutes after I hung up, I'd agreed. I gave him my word. I said, "Yeah, I'll come to Cleveland." Ten minutes later, Charlie Finley called me. He said, "What are you doing, Ken?" He said, "How's it going?" I said, "Fine." And he said, "You got anything working?" I said, "Well, I just hung up with." Segi and I said uh, he said what is he going to give you I said 30 and he says I'll give you 40 <laughs> and you know that's why you have agents yeah. because I gave my word yeah. okay now it, it, to me I gave my word uh, you know who wants to go to Cleveland it's cold yeah. and who doesn't want to be with the team that the, the Oakland A's were they were in the World Series every year yeah yeah. And so anyway, I didn't go and, and I think they made it into the, the World Series. They didn't win it, but uh, they, they got in it. So uh, anyway, that's just a short scenario on my my stupid negotiating <laughs> ability. Oh, that's great. Well, Ken, I'm going to take a short break here. All right. Um, we'll come back. Uh, I'd, I'd uh, actually asked some of my podcast listeners if they would like to listen to you know, a full hour or an hour and a half, whatever straight, or do they want me to break this thing up into segments? And most of them came back and said they'd really appreciate segments. So we're going to say segment one is done. They we'll must be old like me and get <laughs> to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> there you go. So uh, we'll, we'll take a short break here, then we'll uh, come back and get back into it. All righty. Okay, thanks. You bet.